Um, so welcome to this training session brought to you by the Society of American Archivists, the Archivists of Religious Collections section. My name is Michelle Tolley. Uh, we acknowledge that we live and work on the traditional lands of many Indigenous nations. We know that Indigenous peoples have suffered from historical and ongoing injustices and understand as an archival organization that we must work towards sharing historical truths and renew respectful relationships with Indigenous communities. We respect the longstanding relationships that Indigenous nations have to this land as the original caretakers. We are grateful for their stewardship and protection of the water and earth. We pay our respects to elders past and present. Uh, today's topic is Canadian copyright. Um, before I introduce our presenter, let's review the disclaimer. The content in these presentations is for information only and is not legal advice. Our views do not represent the organizations where we work. We do not make any endorsements or guarantees. We are not liable for any loss or damage caused by your use of the content we provide. It is your responsibility to critically evaluate the content we provide, or critically evaluate the content provided in the presentation or any accompanying materials. Also, please remember the point shown on this slide. Um, you will not be able to use your microphone or video during this session. You can click on the closed captioning button at the bottom of your screen and under live transcript, live transcript, click enable auto transcription to get closed captioning. There will be a question period after the presentation concludes. You should use the Q&A feature to ask your questions. We will not answer questions in the chat or unmute attendees due to time constraints. Um, please be respectful in your interactions. We expect you to follow the SAA code of conduct. This session will be recorded and please fill out the short survey after the session ends. We also encourage you to join the Society of American Archivists if you are not a member. Uh, we thank the Congregation of the Sisters of St. Joseph in Canada for hosting this webinar. Um, and now I would like to introduce our presenter. So this is Lisa Macklem. Lisa Macklem is a PhD candidate in law and a lecturer at the University of Western Ontario, whose research focuses on digital content delivery, IP, and the entertainment industry. She focuses on issues of access, copyright, and technology. Fair dealing, online teaching, and technological neutrality, lessons from the COVID-19 crisis, co-written with Samuel Trosau, is in the Intellectual Property Journal, Volume 32, Issue 3, from September 2020, and was cited in the recent Supreme Court of Canada case, York University versus Canadian Copyright Licensing Agency, Access Copyright, 2021, SCC 32. Lisa is a frequent guest speaker in Asia and the US on copyright and entertainment law issues. The floor is yours, Lisa. Thank you. Let me just quickly share my screen. All right, um, let me just uh, go back here and uh, quickly go over what we're going to hopefully get through today, although we may have to shorten this up a little bit. Um, so we're gonna start with a quick history lesson, sort of why the US and Canadian systems are actually pretty similar. Uh, and then we're gonna go through the copyright basics. So looking at copyright scope, like why, what attaches uh, to copyright. So looking at creation, originality, fixation, and duration. We're going to talk a little bit about owner's rights and user's rights. We'll look at fair dealing versus fair use. Um, and along the way, we'll talk a little bit about landmark Canadian cases. And then um, we will have some time for questions at the end. So um, the reason that uh, Canadian and U.S. copyright are, are pretty similar in many, many ways is that we have a very common history. Uh, and I love to sort of lean into the history of, of copyright because it helps us to understand how copyright um, functions today and how it should function today. <laughs> so everything sort of goes back to 1440 with the creation of the printing press. Before then, we had a lot of monks writing things, and that was the only way to copy things. So finally, we have the printing press, and we can copy a lot more things. Um, and it's interesting that new technology and how we define copies is always a challenge to copyright and always seems to sort of push copyright in different directions. 
So in 1557, we had the stationer's monopoly, um, and this was to give uh, control of printed works uh, and the distribution of those printed works to the stationers, to the printers. Um, fun fact, that little uh, picture in the bottom there, uh, I took that in Canterbury, uh, sorry, York, um, this summer. And that was uh, the image that they always use for printers was the little devil <laughs> because they had black fingers all the time. So that was something I learned this summer. Anyways, the Crown was very happy to grant this monopoly to the stationers as a way of preventing seditious works from being propagated and distributed. So um, the return on the investment for owners of copyright still does actually rely in many ways on minimizing competition and tightly controlling access to materials. More about that later. With the advent of the Enlightenment, traditional views of um, God sort of breathing creation uh, into the author or through the author, the author really didn't, wasn't seen to have a lot to do with what was being created, right? It was God breathing through them, uh, but we see that start to change in the Enlightenment. Um, we also see things like scientific studies, debating societies, and a real increased demand for books, um, which were becoming less expensive to produce, um, also driving this um, uh, response to the stationer's monopoly. So in 1710, uh, the stationer's monopoly has been abolished, and we have the Statute of Anne, which is really the very first uh, Copyright Act that we see. Um, and um, its full title uh, was the uh, act, an act for the encouragement of learning by vesting the copies of printed books in the authors or purchasers of such copies during the times therein mentioned. So I want to really lean into that encouragement of learning because that's, that's a, a space that um, both countries come from. The term was 14 years that copyright lasted, and you could apply for a second 14 years if the author was still alive. Um, the Statute of Anne also provided for one copy of every work to be sent to um, nine copyright libraries throughout Great Britain. So there's one in Cambridge, there's one in Edinburgh, there's one in Dublin. Um, and in fact, my background is Trinity Library in Dublin, which is one of those copyright libraries. Um, so this commitment to learning is also reflected uh, in the same requirement for copies to be sent to the Library of Congress. So moving ahead, of course, um, in 1790, uh, the US comes out with their own Copyright Act. Um, Canada took a little longer to break away from Britain. Uh, we had our first Copyright Act in 1924. Um, other things that have uh, created uh, a common ground between nations, uh, international treaties. So the Berne Treaty, I'm going to talk more about that later in the presentation. And trade agreements, uh, so things like the USMCA. So where countries come together and they agree to a certain, um, certain terms uh, that are going to they then take back to their own countries and change their own legislation to be in line with the agreements that they have just signed. So again, some of them are international treaties, some of them are trade agreements, um, driving changes to copyright history, uh, copy to copyright. So some of the philosophical justifications for IP rights. So we have rights-based theories, um, which are based in Lockean labor theory. So they lean into things like personal autonomy, dignity and privacy. And then we have utilitarianism the societal balancing of interests. So that's where we sort of get the owner's rights, user's rights, et cetera. The strongest and most widely used justif justification for IP rights is this utilitarianism. And it is uh, entrenched in the US Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8. And again, I want you to really sort of pay attention to the wording here, right? To promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. So we have this educational piece, we have this innovation piece, we have this um, leaning into you know, authors uh, in both the Statute of Anne and here in uh, the Constitution. So we have these two general systems of copyright laws then that are developing in the world. We have the Anglo-American copyright system reflecting those utilitarian considerations. And then there's this author's right or the droit d'auteur system of continental Europe. 
And that really reflects personality rights based um, theories. Okay, so um, some general differences then in how issues are treated in the two systems, including terms and formalities. And the Berne Convention has resulted in a convergence um, between the two different systems. More about that as we go forward. So now back to the basics. Um, so what uh, in what subject matter does copyright subsist, right? So first of all, we have to determine what is a work. Um, and in section two of the Canadian Copyright Act, we're told every original literary, dramatic, musical, and artistic work includes every original production in the literary, scientific, or artistic domain, whatever may be the mode or form of expression. Uh, so compilations, books, pamphlets, other writings, lectures, dramatic, blah, blah, blah. Um, and it is, of course, we see such as, which is, an illustrative term, okay, so uh, right after uh, form of expression such as, um, it's illustrative, it's not exhaustive, okay, so there's some wriggle room there, if we have something that we've never seen before, uh, it may uh, be um, lumped in there as well. So just to dig a little bit more into the types of works what, that copyright would attach to, uh, literary work would include things like tables, computer programs, compilations of literary works, um, dramatic works, so not just books, right? Um, dramatic works include any piece for recitation, choreographic work or mime, scientific arrangement or acting form of which um, that's fixed in writing, cinematographic work, uh, compilation of dramatic works, um, all of those count as a dramatic work. Musical work uh, means any work of music, or musical composition with or without words and includes any compilation thereof. Artistic work uh, there is going to include paintings, drawings, etc. And then in addition, we have performers, performance, sound recordings, and communication signals. And those are considered to be what are called neighboring rights. So the criteria for copyright to subsist in a work. Uh, in order to qualify then for this protection, um, it has to be original. Okay, now there's no clear definition of that in the act itself, uh, and it's mostly based on case law, um, and uh, that's going to come primarily from one of the landmark Canadian cases, CCH versus LSUC, more about that shortly as well. The work also has to be fixed in a tangible medium, okay. Um, now it's interesting to note, and I'm going to cover this on the next slide, uh, or in a, it's going to come up. Um, so the threshold for originality then, okay, um, and this comes from the, the CCH case, it has to be more than a mere copy of another work, okay, but it doesn't have to be creative in the sense that you've just completely made it up, right, so novel or unique, um, it has to have some kind of exercise of skill and judgment, okay, um, sweat of the brow is too low, rate of spark is too high, the bar is pretty low. We're going to see that in, in the cases that really sort of lay out um, what's going to count as originality. Um, judgment, again, means the use of one's capacity for discernment or ability to form an opinion or evaluation uh, and the exercise of skill and judgment required to produce the work uh, must not be so trivial that it could be characterized as a purely mechanical exercise. And again, as I said, all of this is in paragraph 16 of the CCH case. So fixed in a tangible medium. So here we go to um, the case law in order to really sort of define um, what we're talking about here. So the Canadian Admiralty uh, versus Rediffusion from 1954 established that uh, the broadcast of a Montreal Alouettes football game, um, there was no fixation in a live broadcast. So there would be peripheral um, copies uh, made of different things as we're going from one camera to the other, uh, but there was no actual fixation, okay? So they'd pick one camera, they might look at it for a minute, you know, uh, there might be a little bit of a delay there, uh, but the live signal was going out. So that um, established no fixation in a live broadcast. For originality, and this is where we're gonna, you're gonna really see sort of where that scale lies on um, originality, um, creative spark versus sweat of the brow. So 
Um, the BC Chalky Club versus Stand In in 1986, it was a compilation of information in horse racing forms, and they said that that could be protected. Now, if you've ever gone to the races, very much fun, highly recommend it. Um, you'll and you've seen a racing form, you'll know that the the information is pretty standard that they're going to cover there. You're going they're going to tell you, you know, which horses are running in the race. They're going to tell you who's riding the horse. They're going to tell you the trainer. They're going to tell you the color, the sex. They're going to give you a brief overview of, you know, how the horse is done in, in the last few races, um, how they do on a dry track, a wet track, et cetera. But it's all sort of laid out in a grid. It's pretty easy to read. It's fairly short. Um, but there's enough um, creative element there uh, in deciding, you know, how exactly to set up the pages that that rose to the level of um, originality necessary for uh, copyright to attach. The other case is the Teledirect versus American Business Information from 1998, and that's a telephone directory. Again, um, you know, how can that rise to that level? But interestingly enough, the uh, test for originality in the United States also comes from a telephone book case uh, called Feist, um, where they also uh, said that that was sort of the base level of originality. And again, the creative element there is deciding exactly how to arrange things on the page itself. So the threshold is low, as we see here, but it does exist. So fixation requirement um, doesn't apply to a performer's performance, communication signal, or a sound recording. And so those are those neighboring rights. And again, sometimes they will have um, different uh, requirements. So that idea expression dichotomy, right? Copyright does not apply to ideas um, and it does not apply to a fax. To facts. So copyright applies to the original expression of ideas or facts in a tangible medium. And um, of course, it's important to disallow copyright protection for ideas or facts because those need to be um, freely available uh, to the public. Um, unprotected facts can be arranged in a compilation, right? Like the telephone book, like a racing directory. Um, and in such a way that they do attract that level of copyright protection. So there is a dividing line then between ideas and expressions. Um, again, it's going to be a bit of a sliding scale, but there are some guidelines to help us. Um, so you start adding things like character names, character traits, um, plot twists, setting scenery to your basic boy meets girl, but their families don't get along. Not even that they're feuding, their families don't get along, right? Um, classic Romeo and Juliet. Um, I'll pause here to say, just to remind everybody that if, you, if you're not aware, Shakespeare was a terrible plagiarist. <laughs> um, he did not come up with a whole Romeo and Juliet um, scenario. He borrowed that from somebody else. Uh, but of course, we are very happy that he did because he added so much creative spark to that um, protected expression. Except, of course, the copyright on Shakespeare has, worn, has um, run out. Um, so that is in the public domain. Um, so that's where we, um, and this, this is something, of course, that comes up as um, different litigants may just, you know, want to dispute that, right? Um, well, your character is wearing spandex and has a cape. Um, so isn't that just Superman? Well, no, <laughs> um, there's a lot more to it than that. And we want there to be. So the initial ownership of copyright and works um, is the author, okay? So the author is set out as being the first owner and this is in section 13 sub one of the Canadian Copyright Act. Um, Exceptions are, are enumerated in sex, section 13 sub three. So the employer for works made in the course of employment, okay, may be in, considered the owner, okay? Um, there's three conditions for this to apply, okay? So the author of a work has, uh, was in the employment of some other person under a contract of service or apprenticeship. Work must be made within the course of the employment and it has to be in the absence of any agreement to the contrary. Now, in Canada, the uh, we don't really have work for hire as such as there is in the United States. Um, so 
it's easier in the United States to claim work for hire than it is in Canada. Um, however, there's the, the real point here is that it's important to look at any contract, right? So um, if there's any doubt, you should not assume that you're going to be protected by the default rule uh, and employers are becoming more interested in owning rights. So uh, it's important to check those sorts of things in any employment contract, right? So am I going to own any creative works that I produce or is my employer going to own it? So um, I'm happy to say that my contract as a, a, an instructor um, means that I actually own my copyrighted works. So in Canada, we also have what's called crown copyright, um, which means that um, any uh, work that is or has been prepared or published or uh, by or under the direction or control of Her Majesty or any government department, uh, copyright is owned by the Crown. And in fact, um, they usually make these things available at no charge. Um, but the idea is that the unfortunate thing is that the author themselves does not control the copyright. Uh, and this can become, uh, become an issue. Um, there was a recent case, um, uh, Ketley, and I'm completely blanking on the other versus the Crown, um, and uh, it was uh, somebody who had uh, prepared some government documents and wanted to be able to use um, the charts and things that they had produced, uh, but they were not able to. And in fact, it was interesting. We're in the process of having a copyright review right now. Um, and the Supreme Court uh, said in that particular case uh, that perhaps Crown copyright was something that uh, the government should look at as they are thinking to review the legislation. <laughs> Um, and I will compare this to U.S. Copyright Act Section 105, where copyright does not subsist in the works of the federal government, right? They are produced and made available for the public interest. So registration of copyright. Now, historically, uh, complying with formality, so having, you know, you have to register, there's a, a fee to do that, um, was required uh, for copyright to subsist in a work, okay? And that comes to us right from Statute of Anne um, through uh, US copyright, et cetera. Um, in continental systems, however, copyright arises automatically upon creation with no formalities, right? So the Berne Convention, I told you we'd get back to the Berne Convention, removes formalities for copyright to subsist. So there are no formalities in Canada or the US, okay? So as soon as you put pen to paper, um, that is copyrighted. That's all you have to do. You don't have to do anything else. You own it. You created it. Bob's your uncle. However, <laughs> there are some advantages to registration. Um, it does provide good evidence of the facts. So when was this created? Who created it? Right. Here's our evidence. Uh, it prevents the defendant from claiming innocent infringement. Okay, so you can prove, look, I wrote this. They can't just say, oh no, I, you know, we we just happened to both come up with it at the same time, or or you know, I'm sure I invented it before you do. You've got proof of when you actually created this thing. Um, most copyrights are not registered. Um, I will add that in the US, if you want to sue somebody for copyright infringement, your copyright has to be registered. Okay, so that's another reason in the US why it's still. Um, important uh, for particularly valuable copyrighted things um, to register them if you think you're, you're going to have an infringement case. So finally, duration of copyright term for works. So the general rule here is life of the author, the remainder of the calendar year in which the author dies, and a period of 70 years following the end of that calendar year. So in Canada, the duration of copyright is life of the author plus 70 years. Once that runs out, a work would end up in what is called the public domain. So it's important not to confuse the public domain with the internet, <laughs> okay? Just because something is on the internet does not mean it's in the public domain. Um, so life of the author plus 70. And this is another uh, place where those trade deals come into um, prominence. So the USMCA, as I mentioned earlier, is why in Canada, the duration is now life of the author plus seven years, because we agreed to that through the trade deal. 
up until uh, December 31st of 2022, it was uh, life of the author plus 50 years. Uh, and that is what's called the minimum, um, sort of the threshold uh, for most um, uh, copyright systems. Okay, so that's uh, what's enumerated in Burn. Okay, um, but trade deals often push these um, lengths up. So um, in that particular case, we sort of, it was probably a better case than it might have been in that the duration of copyright in Mexico, because of course USMCA was the trade deal between the US, Mexico, and Canada, duration of copyright in Mexico is life of the author plus 100 years. Um, in the US, it's life of the author plus 70. So we um, had to agree to that, as I said, during uh, because of that, that trade deal. Um, so I just want to point out that we started out at 14 years, okay, plus another 14 if the author was still alive. So the, it was meant to benefit the author during their lifetime, okay? Um, then it was extended to just 28 years for quite a long time. Okay, and then it's slowly gotten longer as um, we, we've gone along. So a question that I often ask myself is how much benefit is it doing an author? Okay, if copyright is supposed to be both a reward and an incentive, right? So we're, we're using that um, copyright in order for authors to be able to support themselves, um, and to create new works, it's an incentive uh, to create new works as well, because then you're gonna have this uh, income, hopefully. Um, I always ask myself, how, how is that happening after the author has actually died? I don't think they're creating a lot more. So um, duration of copyright for other subject matter. And I'm just going to go through this really super quickly because um, it's, it's complicated. You can look it up if you really need to know about it. Um, but at performance, perform, performance, performance, um, the duration exists until 50 years after the end of the calendar year in which the performance occurs. Okay. Um, if it's fixed uh, in a sound recording, uh, before the copyright expires, the copyright continues until the end of 70 years after the calendar year in which the first fixation happened. Um, if a sound recording in which the performance is fixed is published before the copyright expires, then you get 75 years. Uh, sound recording, 70 years. Um, copyright continues until the earlier of 75 years after the calendar year, uh, if it's published before copyright expires. Um, and then you get 100 years. Um, uh, if the sound recording uh, occurs um, after the end of the calendar year in which the first fixation occurs. Uh, copyright and communication signal subsists until the end of 50 years after the end of the calendar year in which the communication signal is broadcast. So one of the things to um, be aware of is when you're trying to determine the parameters of a particular work's copyright, it's very important to understand what kind of a work it is that you are looking at. And then you can go to the specific part of the Copyright Act um, that's going to give you that information. This is just a fun thing. <laughs> um, clown copyright, um, clown makeup, uh, how it's, it's original, uh, but it's not really fixed, but it is in the registry. So in London, England, uh, there is a registry for clown copyright. And um, on the same trip, when I visited York, I also met uh, Maddie, who is pictured here holding his own clown um, makeup. So what they do is they take um, the original makeup and they paint it on an egg, and then it is placed in this copyright uh, registry for clown makeup. So uh, it's fixed then in a tangible medium, and uh, there we go. Uh, so that's just kind of a fun a fun thing, but it also uh, gives us a little chance to look at fixation and originality as well. All right, so moral rights is something um, that is not uh, included in uh, American copyright, uh, but it is included in Canada. Um, it's a European concept, uh, especially in France and Germany, very strong proponents there. Generally foreign to countries in the common law tradition, um, but it was added to the Berne Convention in 1928, and it was first enacted in Canada in 1931. So it creates a bundle of rights that are different and separate from economic rights. 
Um, and in uh, US copyright law, this has been um, sort of folded in as attribution rights um, rather than strictly as moral rights. And that's something else to bear in mind is that when countries uh, agree to terms in, in one of these um, agreements, uh, they then have to blend it into their own um, national uh, laws and legislation. And they do have some wiggle room as to how they do that. Um, so this is just uh, article uh, six in the Berne Convention, right? Independently of the author's copyright and even after the assignment, either wholly or partially of the said copyright, the author has the right to claim authorship of the work as well as the right to restrain any distortion, mutilation, or other modification of the work that would be prejudicial to his honor or reputation. So again, this is seen as attribution rights in US copyright, um, but in Canada, we have um, full on moral rights. So section two gives us a uh, definition, um, the right to the integrity of the work, the right where reasonable in the circumstances to be associated with the work uh, as its author by name or under a pseudonym, and also the right to remain anonymous. So moral rights in uh, the work are the same um, term as the copyright of the work, okay? So same duration. Um, and the rights pass on the death of the author uh, by specific bequest to the person to whom the copyright is bequeathed or to the person entitled to any other property in respect of which the author dies intestate. So moral rights are not assignable, okay? So you can't just, you can't sign them away. You can waive them in whole or in part, however, uh, but you can't assign somebody else to determine um, your moral rights. Um, so an assignment of copyright and work does not, by that act alone, constitute a waiver of any moral rights. So you can sell the economic interest in your copyright, but you still retain the moral rights unless you waive them. So any act or omission that is contrary to any of the moral rights of the author of a work or the performer of a performer's performances in the absence of the author's or performer's consent and infringement of those moral rights, okay? Um, and that's a pretty broad uh, ambit, right? Act or omission. So if you do something or you fail to do something, right? So if you do something to affect the integrity or you omit the author and they wanna be attributed, okay? Or you fail to keep them anonymous. So the author's or performer's right to the integrity of a work um, is infringed only if the work of the performance is to the prejudice of its author's uh, or performer's honor or reputation, distorted, mutilated, or otherwise modified, okay, used in association with a product, service, cause, or institution. And there are some limitations to the infringement of integrity, right? So, um, just changing the location doesn't count, uh, changing uh, in the physical means by which a work is exposed, a change in the physical structure containing a work, and steps taken in good faith to, resort, to restore or preserve uh, the work. So the big moral rights case um, in Canada is Snow versus Eaton Center. And this is really um, pretty much uh, the biggie, um, the one uh, case that made it all the way up. Um, so the cause of action here uh, was um, the uh, sculptor, Snow, uh, had been commissioned by the Eaton Center, Toronto Eaton Center, to create these, um, this geese sculpture. Still hangs in, in uh, what is formerly known as the Eaton Center. Uh, and uh, it was meant to um, be indicative of um, freedom, um, you know, the wild of the North, et cetera. Um, and the problem happened when the center created a Christmas advertising campaign centered around the addition of a red bow to the geese. They wanted to make them more festive. Um, they really go all out when they um, decorate uh, the mall. So, um, Snow, of course, objected to this, okay, um, because it went exactly against what he wanted the sculpture to um, symbolize, right? So um, he did not want these red bows. And uh, it is the only published Canadian decision so far upholding moral rights. Uh, it has a provision deeming prejudice if there's a modification of a sculpture, okay? 
Um, and the test used for prejudice was a reasonable opinion of the author of the work. So it was a subjective test as well. Um, so the end result was that the court ordered that the ribbons be removed, snow won, uh, and the geese were able to fly free and unencumbered by consumerism, uh, et cetera. All right. Um, so the owner's exclusive rights in a work, and these are often referred to as those economic rights that I've already alluded to. Alluded to. So section three sub one, copyright in relation to a work means the sole right to produce or reproduce the work of any substantial part therein in any material form, et cetera. Now, the creator is automatically the first owner of the rights in a work. Um, however, you will notice that it says the owner, not creator, okay? Um, generally speaking, in order to have one's work distributed, they're going to have to license it to somebody else. And they be then become the owner of either an exclusive or perhaps a limited license. So the owner has the sole right to produce, reproduce, form, or publish any translation, to convert in a dramatic work, to convert a novel, to make sound recordings, et cetera. And I'm just gonna jump through this a little bit more quickly as we're getting a little tight in time. Um, it also includes many other rights, right? So uh, to rent, um, reproduce uh, computer programs, et cetera. Um, basically, let's just say make copies. So the um, Supreme Court in the Tiberge v. Um, Gallery d'Art uh, decision said that excessive control by holders of copyrights and other forms of intellectual property may unduly limit the ability of the public domain to incorporate and embellish creative innovation in the long-term interests of society as a whole or create practical obst obstacles to proper utilization. Um, so there have to be limits to how much control essentially the owner can place on copyright. So infringement then um, is for any person to do without the consent of the owner of the copyright, anything that is by the act of the owner, uh, only the owner has um, the right to do. So again, this applies generally to works and other subject matter, okay? Um, consent can be expressed or implied, right? So if there's a link to print, et cetera, to email, um, that's basically consent to share, okay? Um, if we look at, uh, you know, uh, a Word document, right? Those are also uh, examples of implied consent. So, to review, <laughs> um, up to the point of infringement, um, you have to make sort of an analysis, right? Is there a protectable subject matter? Have requirements of fixation and originality been met? Is the work or other subject matter still within the copyright term? Has one of the three rights, reproduction, public performance, been implicated? In the case of a reproduction, um, has the threshold requirement of substantiality been met? Um, was there consent? Okay, so all of these issues need to be resolved in favor of the copyright holder before it becomes established um, that you need a defense to infringement, okay? This all establishes a prima facie copyright infringement, and then the onus is going to shift to the defendant to establish a defense, okay? So don't begin an analysis of a copyright problem um, with fair dealing. You need to do this step first, okay? So does copyright actually exist here? So fair dealing in Canada, um, for the purposes of um, research, private study, education, parity, or satire, does not infringe copyright, uh, criticism or review, and news reporting. So these all fall under the fair dealing exception. Um, so to claim fair dealing, you have to fit within one of these particular categories. Um, the historical background for fair dealing, it's not in the Statute of Anne. Um, and uh, case law in the US goes back to the 1840s, but it wasn't codified until 1976 Act in Section 107 in the American Act. Um, it was codified in the UK Act of 1911. Uh, we had Canadian amendments in 1993 that added uh, attribution requirements for criticism review and newspaper summary. Canadian amendments to 1997 um, replaced newspaper summary. Um, and Canadian amendments in 2012 added categories of education, parody, and satire. Um, and I'm just gonna skip over that a little bit. Um, so uh, fair dealing, uh, sorry, fair use in the US 
uh, is in, covered in section 107. Um, the fair dealing factors in Canada are only covered in uh, precedential case, the CCH um, Supreme Court case, uh, but in the US, of course, it is laid out, uh, the four factors are laid out in the statute itself. So um, comparing US fair use and Canadian fair dealing, the US subject matter of fair use for purposes such as, so again, such as is non-exclusive. So it widens the ambit a little bit for the US, right? So criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, uh, scholarship and research. In Canada, Canadian fair dealing categories for purposes of, and it's enumerated categories and they're exclusive. So there isn't a lot of wiggle room here, except that the Supreme Court has stated that um, the courts should take a large and liberal reading of these purposes, right? So look at them expansively, not restrictively. So research, private study, criticism and review, news reporting, and then they added parody, satire and education. Um, so again, I'm just going to skip over this one. <laughs> Uh, and then just comparing the fairness criteria, right? So for in Canada, it comes to us as a precedent. In the US, it is entrenched in um, the act itself in section 107. But you'll notice that number one is purpose and character for the US. Purpose and character uh, are separate categories in Canada. But again, then we have amount of the dealing, uh, alternatives to the dealing, nature of the work and effect of the dealing on the work. Um, amount and substantiality is covered under three, nature is one, and then the effect of the use upon the potential market or value of the copyrighted work. Now, in both cases, none of the factors are supposed to be more important than the others. It's a holistic look at these four factors. Often what you'll see in cases is that the court will go through and they'll say, this side wins factor one, this side wins factor two, this side wins factor three, this side wins factor four, or one, two, uh, three, four, five, and six in Canada. And then it's it's going to be, well, you know, this outweighs this, so this, this side wins. So um, again, uh, the CCH uh, uh, versus LSUC case is where these come to us, um, the, the um, six factors come to us. Um, this case is really interesting because it was a library doing copying for lawyers. Okay, so it was a great library, um, law library doing uh, photocopying cases for lawyers uh, as they did research. Okay, um, and this was easily seen to be fair dealing. Uh, it was done for public interest um, and it was not a factor. Uh, and again, I'm gonna skip through this really quickly, right? Purpose must be an allowable purpose. It was research, character of the dealing. Um, it was one copy per lawyer, uh, the amount of the dealing, right? So again, um, when we talk about amount of the dealing, I will pause here just for a minute. Um, it's not just a matter of, there's no, there's no blue lines, clear lines here. Uh, it's always going to be a weighing of the factors, right? So there's no clear 10%, okay? That is not written anywhere in anybody's Copyright Act. Um, it's going to be a matter of, did you take as much as you needed to to achieve the purpose that you were trying to achieve? Um, did you take the heart of it, right? So it might be a smaller amount if that's like the, the main part of, of what you were copying from, um, but it could be a lot more um, if that was as much as you needed to be able to achieve the purpose you were trying to achieve. Alternatives to the dealing, um, you know, this was the only work that I could go to, right? They have to look at certain precedents, right? There was no alternative there uh, and the nature of the work. So strong public interest and access to legal resources would um, be in favor of the library, of course and the economic impact on the owner, right? How is the market for the work impacted by the fair dealing in question? Is this taking money out of somebody else's pockets? Um, and in that case, it was, it was clearly decided that, that it was not. Um, I'm just gonna click through this very quickly. <laughs> um, one of the other issues is whether reproductions made in the library copy services within the, fair, it, within the scope of fair dealing, and it was found that it was. Um, it is important to note that there, that two-part analysis is still required. We have to determine whether or not it's copyright infringement, whether or not the work itself has 
copyright protection. Um, and then we go through the, the various factors. Um, so the Supreme Court concluded um, that LSUC's dealings with the publisher's works satisfy the fair dealing defense and that the law society does not infringe copyright. Um, so some of the 2012 amendments to the Copyright Act, this was a big year for Canada. Um, we had to uh, add in that it was illegal to circumvent digital locks to protect digital content from unauthorized access. That was um, another uh, pressure from an outside lobby group, uh, even when the material is downloaded for personal use, research or study purposes. And of course, this has troubled people's ability to actually um, uh, be able to uh, repair their own work um, or their own uh, things that they own. Uh, so this has, has come up again and again. ISPs are required to inform infringers of violations, more about that in a minute. Uh, there were some exceptions for personal use that were added, and then, of course, the Marrakesh Treaty, which is administered by WIPO, the World Intellectual Property um, Organization, uh, that did allow for digital locks to be circumvented in um, uh, providing for large print works or works in large print for people who were visually um, impaired. Um, so that was one thing um, that, that was able to be added. So uh, the infringement elements of it, um, in the states we have um, notice and uh, takedown and in Canada, we have um, notice and notice. So in the US, if the owner asserts infringement and notifies the ISP, uh, the IAP, ISP has to immediately take down that YouTube video, for example, okay? If the owner wants to have it put back up, they have to start legal proceedings and, and so forth in order to be able to do that. Um, in Canada, um, the owner asserts infringement and the ISP has to notify the uh, poster that they've been accused of infringement and then they can decide whether or not they wanna take it down or not. If they decide not to take it down because they are determined that it's not infringing, now the person asserting infringement has to put their money where their mouth is and start the legal proceedings in order to be able to have it taken down. So notice and notice really assumes that um, the poster is innocent, okay? Whereas the notice and takedown uh, assumes that the poster is, is basically guilty uh, and puts um, the onus of uh, legal action on them. All right, um, two of the cases um, that came out of uh, a five case uh, bonanza from the Supreme Court in 2012, SoCan versus Bell um, was looking at online music previews and the scope of research in the commercial context. And the Supreme Court said that um, the tiny little um, previews of music for um, ringtones was absolutely fair use or fair dealing rather. Um, and that SOCAN was not entitled to getting royalties on those previews, right? Uh, consumers needed to be able to do research before they actually bought a ringtone. And in Alberta education, um, this was uh, uh, copying in a K-12 context and um, under the scope of private study because this was actually decided before the amendments that allowed education and it was seen to be um, fair dealing that teachers were making copies for students. Um, York University versus Access Copyright is an interesting case uh, as well. Um, cutting to the chase because we are running out of time and I wanna leave some time for Q&A. Uh, the Supreme Court decided that the tariffs handed down uh, from Access Copyright uh, were not mandatory because Access Copyright did not actually hold exclusive licenses to copyrighted works that, universe, that York was using. And university, uh, York University was paying for databases. They were paying for these works. They weren't taking them um, you know, without paying a royalty on them. Uh, and uh, the, the court went on, Justice Abella went on uh, to talk a little bit about copyright, although in the end, the copyright infringement didn't really uh, count as um, a part of the decision because once your uh, once access copyright didn't have an exclusive license, there was no infringement. Uh, however, um, Justice Abella did lean into the fact that you needed to look at who the real end user was. And it wasn't the university, it was the students and public interest 
um, determined that uh, there was probably fair dealing going on there. Um, there are some other special exceptions to infringement. So there are special exceptions for educational institutions, um, uh, et cetera. I'm just gonna go through these really, really quickly. Um, uh, 29.21 is a non-commercial user generated content, the YouTube exception that came out in 2012. Um, you'll notice that it has a four factor test built into it. Um, and this is uh, for no, solely non-commercial purposes. It's called the YouTube um, exception because it was generally touted for, you know, people who are putting together mashup videos and things like that. But that of course is not the only thing it applies to. Um, but again, um, you know, this is a way of encouraging people to gain experience uh, with videos, et cetera. Um, and it's in the public interest to make those um, able to, uh, to be done. Um, so section two, library, archive, or museum. Um, so display purposes of instruction in educational institutions, uh, also um, special exceptions. In general, the special exceptions for libraries, archives, uh, et cetera, they really only need to be turned to if your fair dealing analysis isn't enough, okay? Fair dealing is usually going to give you more scope than um, the special sections at the end. Um, so performances in educational institutions was also added. Uh, persons with perceptual difficulties, as I already said, was the Marrakesh Treaty. And I'm gonna leave it there. Um, and thank you very much for your attention. I know that was a whirlwind and um, we'll leave it open if there are questions. Thank you so much, Lisa. That was great. <laughs> very, very engaging. I love the, uh, the geese story. <laughs> <laughs> the geese case. I, for some reason, have not heard of that one before, but that was really cool. Um, we do have a couple questions, so I will go through a few of them and see how many we can get through. Um, so the first question is, uh, would fair dealing cover a museum digitizing a work and then making that work freely available online? Um, it should. Um, I, I want to be cautious here because I know um, uh, there are there are a lot of um, variables here, um, but again, if it's if it's being made available um, on a non-commercial site, uh, and it is, it would also depend on whether or not it was still under copyright. So there are a lot of variables there. So your analysis, as I said, you'd first want to determine, you know, does copyright exist. Um, could you just tell me the question again quickly, just so I have? Uh, yeah. Would fair dealing cover a museum digitizing a work and then, oh, just disappeared, hang on. <laughs> uh, digitizing a work and then making that work freely available online. Right. Okay. So um, you want to start your analysis with whether or not the work is actually under copyright. Okay. So um, it's entirely possible that a museum has things that are long out of copyright, in which case, absolutely, you can, you don't even need to go for fair dealing. You're just, absolutely allowed to do that. Um, if it is still under copyright, it would depend on what the agreement is for display that the museum has. Um, I would really want to make the case that if you have a license to display it, that should apply to your website as well. Um, but uh, I would be cautious about uh, I would be cautious about that. Okay. Um, we'll go through a couple more. Um, I'm curious if you have any thoughts about copyright alternatives like copyleft, uh, creative, co creative Commons, and other avenues uh, that attempt to conceive of rights in a different, sometimes complementary and sometimes hostile traditional copyright way. Oh, I have lots of, <laughs> lots of support, absolutely, um, for the common um, uh, Creative Commons. Uh, licenses. Absolutely. I'm a big proponent of Creative Commons licenses, um, and I didn't have a chance to mention those. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Anybody who is publishing anything can uh, choose one of the licenses, and there's a sliding scale of what kind of a license that you want to attach to it. Um, so you can, you know, put your stuff out there with a Creative Commons license on it, and it might say, um, you can use this in any way, shape, or form you like. Okay, just make it absolutely available, basically putting it out in the public domain. Um, you can also say, um, you can use this in your work, 
Uh, but then your work also has to make it available the same way I've made it. Um, you can say you can use this, but only for non-commercial purposes. Um, and I'm forgetting one. Um, and usually there's an attribution element to it, right? So you can use it, but you have to, you know, say that you got it from me. Um, so yeah, I'm absolutely a huge proponent of those. Um, you know, anything that puts more control in the hands of creators, I am a big supporter of. Absolutely. Great, thank you. Um, another one that I also am interested in, um, as an oral historian, I'd appreciate your take on legal moral rights regarding or re, uh, regarding recording creators and the interviewee sharing their knowledge. Yes, and that's actually a very important Canadian case as well. Um, you may be thinking about the case where a researcher went um, to the far north and uh, recorded a bunch of oral stories from uh, some Inuit people in the north um, and then published them. And then it took, I think, roughly over 40 years for them to get the copyright back in their own oral tradition. Um, I, this, is, this is an area of unsettled law right now. Um, and I think that this is a, an area where uh, the copyright review that we have going on right now really needs to be digging into this. I, I fear that they are not. Uh, I believe that Indigenous people should be allowed to control their culture however they wish to control it. Um, and I think that the fixation requirement is, is troubling to this because in oral traditions, there is no fixation. However, we do have performers' performance, and that may be a way to give control to those people with those oral stories. There's other cultural um, things that that fit in here as well, uh, in that you know some um, oral tradition are only meant to be shared among a very select uh, group of people, not even all Indigenous people, but very specific people, um, and I think those cultural um, issues need to be. Um, uh, given um, thought as well. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. I think maybe we have time for one more. Um, this one is kind of two questions in one as well. So we'll see uh, how we get through this one. Um, does the co Canadian copyright term extension apply retroactively? And what about rights to translating the material into another language? They don't apply retroactively. So that's good. <laughs> um, I mean, the, the big, the biggest problem really is that, um, you know, we, we're going to have 20 years where we don't have anything coming into the public domain, right? Um, so that that is, that is a problem. Um, uh, sorry, what was the second part? Uh, what about rights to translating the material into another language? Um, those reside originally with the owner of the copyright. Okay. Um, I think we're going to have to leave it there. Um, there's a couple other questions, but unfortunately, we're right at the end of our time here. So um, I just want to say thank you again to Lisa for this amazing presentation. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, if anyone is interested, our next session um, is going to be about environment, storage, and integrated pest man management. Um, that will be Monday, September 18th at 3 o'clock. Um, and the presenters will be Holly Fielder from the Sisters of St. Francis and Iona McCraith, uh, an archives consultant. So if you would like to attend that one, please sign up. We'd love to have you. And thank you again for attending.